thank you everyone for staying till the very end of this wonderful conference. It's been such an exciting two days and I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. I hope that you guys have enjoyed yourself as well. And you have had some really, you know, wow and aha moments um, during this entire time. And I feel so inspired, you know, to talk about my presentation after this parents panel and listening to all your experiences. So today I uh, want to talk and share about the different birth models in India that I have had the privilege and the honor to be a part of. You know, how do we find a middle ground going forward? We are such a huge country. Uh, we are so many people. And I think we should use that to our advantage and our benefit and bring about change in little ways, definitely. But also we can get together and bring about change in big, big ways. India has already taken steps to introduce uh, midwifery care, modern midwifery, as we call it in uh, many ways. Uh, how do we make it better? How do we learn from other countries have been doing for years together? Uh, how do we learn from their good things? How, um, yeah, here we go. I just want to say before I start my presentation that you'll find my presentation full of pictures. And, you know, I want to say that uh, I've asked all the people who have contributed to this presentation that I've taken permission from them and I thank them for being my teachers and as an extension, your teachers in some way as well. All right. Why should we discuss about birth models in India? So to, to quickly talk about this picture that I have, uh, you know, some of the questions that arose earlier, how long can we keep the cord intact? Can you see how this cord looks? And uh, I think, uh, you know, this was uh, this picture was taken by a birth photographer and uh, she was like, can we do a heart with the uh, umbilical cord? And uh, we were like, yeah, why not? And uh, you can see that big, beautiful, chunky placenta alongside this beautiful baby. Uh, it was at least an hour or so after birth, uh, the placenta and baby are still attached as they were for, you know, the nine, eight, nine long months that um, attachment uh, started, right? So discussing birth models uh, is significant because uh, where we birth and with whom we birth, you know, has an influence on how the birth unfolds and uh, what the outcomes are. And I just hope that, you know, what I share will have you all, you know, rethinking and reimagining how we can improve things for our mothers and babies. And really, it's it's going to also impact you as a care provider, because when we make things, as, you know, Joella was talking about, when we make it easier and more straightforward and we support our families to give birth, we create less work for our ourselves and we make this, um, you know, important work that we're all doing sustainable. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm a certified international midwife and I have an extensive support in low risk normal births. I have uh, also actively supported women in lactation and I help families uh, through education and awareness building to prepare for, you know, what lies ahead in their journey of parenting. I'm also a birth business entrepreneur, uh, as we just shared uh, a few minutes back. I opened, uh, along with a wonderful team, uh, the very first birth center in Bangalore a few years back. I've consulted uh, with uh, multiple hospitals in Bangalore and elsewhere on how to build water birth facilities and, you know, in-house natural birth suites. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we are all set to launch my next birth center uh, with integrated side along obstetric unit, and it's going to be called Madilu. I believe that every birther deserves choice, compassion, and safety. And all of these qualities have to, you know, lay on top of each other, intermingle, intermix, you know, and I think we stand to benefit as a whole society and as humankind. So I'll be talking about different models of care. And the very first model I'd like to share with you guys is a freestanding birth center. So freestanding is a term that's typically used in many of the Western countries. Uh, what does it actually mean? I mean, it, you can see this uh, picture here. Uh, it is a bedroom. It could be a bedroom in your house or my house. And what's, what's so different about it? 
what's different is that you know we had quite a few births happen in this setting you see a random uh, birth ball there which is very strategically positioned it's it's a labor tool that a lot of our uh, clients used to go through their uh, contractions we have a lot of things uh, that we use our tools you know as care providers as midwives we use that is actually not seen in this particular setting because it's all behind the cupboard that you see off to the right the idea is that in this model of care in a freestanding birth center uh, we facilitate normal births for healthy women and according to WHO, about 80 to 85 percent of women can give birth vaginally. And creating this sort of a model and creating this sort of an environment can actually help facilitate women, 80 to 85 percent of those women, to reach their goal of having a normal vaginal birth. So let's talk about prenatal care. So our prenatal care, the, the schedule that we follow is very similar to any model of care, pregnancy model of care that's present, uh, obstetric or any other, you know, model where we see them at regular intervals throughout their pregnancy. Uh, but what is different is that we spend a lot of time getting to know our clients. Our clients get to know us uh, at a very deep level. Uh, by the time that they are ready to step into the next stage, that is labor, they know who is going to be present at their birth and uh, what to expect. So we have uh, birth preparation classes. Uh, we use different uh, techniques and tools to, you know, bring out their not just their desires, but also what their deep thoughts are, what their principles are, and also what they want to discuss about and what they're afraid of, what they've heard of, and everything, doubts, fears, everything is brought out into the fore. You know, our waiting room is usually filled with these lovely families, with lovely bellies and it's it's a it's really a birth community that we're building because uh you know our, our parents get to interact with each other at different stages in their journey and that way they can draw reassurance that i'm not the only one who's doing this who's straying uh, and who's opting for uh, a very alternative birthing way from what has been you know considered the mainstream We are definitely focused on the family, right? The mother and the baby are definitely the center of our care, but the extension of the mother and baby, her support system, uh, who are going to be there for her, are also equally, as equally, or if not more involved in the care. So you see uh, the the two pictures here uh, where, uh, you know, one, the one, the left corner, uh, the husband is uh, trying to palpate uh, his, he's palpating uh, his wife's belly to find the baby's position. And uh, he wanted to, you know, do it before we had our hands uh, on the belly to find the baby's position. Uh, uh, then the one in the middle is uh, a picture of uh, this mom who is on her due date and she's not yet in labor, but you can see that her, you know, she's had her support system. Her mother was there, her sister was there, her older uh, kid was there, and uh, uh, they were all a part of the prenatal consult. Uh, the third picture is uh, me auscultating using a fetoscope, the a 28 week old fetus. And it was a, a teaching moment uh, where, uh, you know, I had a team with whom I was discussing how we provide clinical aspects of the prenatal care. As midwives, we use a lot of techniques from our toolbox to, you know, work with physiology, as uh, Joella shared in her presentation. The first picture is one of... Uh, uh, a reverse vulture's position where this baby was pers persistently OP in uh, the last few weeks of her pregnancy. And uh, we are trying to create less space in her back and more space in her anterior part, her abdomen, so that the baby can actually wiggle and get into a more optimal birthing position. Uh, and we are ensuring that we are supporting her, you know, both her head and her knees uh, so that she feels comfortable. 
in this position. We do regular vital checks like uh, it's done in all uh, care models. So the mother's vitals are uh, checked throughout every visit in her pregnancy, her weight. And we also listen to the baby and we also do a deep dive uh, into nutrition um, that forms a big part of our consults on her emotional and men mental well-being as well. We have pretty long discussions about uh, birth preparation, what to expect, what's normal, what uh, are complications, what uh, uh, what do, what do what does your midwifery team do in case uh, you have a complication. So all of that uh, is discussed. Uh, in the prenatal uh, period so that when the uh, parents are in labor, they're not worried and they can be, you know, reassured at every step of the way. So this is one of my clients who at 34 weeks, uh, we discovered that her baby was breech. And I sent her off uh, to an ultrasound to confirm uh, whether it was indeed a uh, a baby who was in the breech position and she was very committed to have a normal vaginal birth so she was like let's try and turn this baby so these were some of the techniques that uh, we employed to have the baby uh, in a uh, cephalic position and uh, at about 37 weeks uh, baby remained breached up to 37 weeks and at 37 weeks uh, her baby finally decided to go into a cephalic position so we did a lot of repositioning exercises and talking to the baby and we have a whole um, breach turning protocol that we followed with her and it really worked in this model of care what does labor look like right uh, so the next natural progression from being pregnant is uh, entering labor and one of the things that uh, as midwives uh, we do is uh, we wait and uh, we discuss the importance of waiting for our labor to start on its own so the the very first uh, picture uh, are uh, these are my two sisters they're uh, twins and uh, both of them had babies with uh, with us and uh, the one in the middle she is the one pregnant uh, she was uh, laboring uh, at home for the previous 24 hours she was in early labor and uh, we usually reassure all our clients that in early labor they can stay in the comfort of their home and they can rest and sleep uh, she came in at around five o'clock in the morning for admission and uh, we greet our clients at the doorstep of the center and uh, you know that's one of the ways to you know celebrate uh, you know that she's in fact entering into the next phase of her journey to become a parent and uh, once she was uh, admitted, she had her baby within the next 12 hours. So she had her baby at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the evening. The photo in the middle is uh, Sneha, who presented yesterday, and Smriti, who was there in the session uh, at the parents' panel. So she uh, was here, and uh, Sneha is uh, Sneha just listened to the baby uh, using a handheld Doppler, and uh, she's just telling the rest of the midwifery team that the baby sounds great. And you can see, you know, there are uh, fairy lights in the background. There are some birth affirmations and pictures that Smriti had brought along. So we encourage our clients to make their birth space their own by bringing in anything that they feel is important to, to them in this process and the last picture is that of Mopia in active labor and she's using the birth swing to you know hold on and you can see her husband is behind her supporting her while all these pictures look quite bright I would reassure you that there were no bright lights dot dot so once uh, you once our clients are in the throes of labor and active labor there are many more tools that uh, we utilize to bring them uh, to bring to them to suggest and they also instinctively know that this is what is working for them and not working for them they get into a rhythm of birth um so here we have this client who is leaning on her husband you can see that her husband is in a pretty awkward position but he's doing all that he can to support her and the one in the middle uh, is the mother supporting her daughter to help bring you know, her grandbaby into this world. 
and uh, she really had a lot of lower back pain because the baby was quite low in her birth uh, canal in the mid pelvis by that point of time. I had just listened to the baby and I'm sitting and, you know, just whispering words of encouragement to the mother who's going through a contraction. The last picture is that of uh, what we call as belly sifting. And that's uh, the, uh, the advantage of uh, doing this is twofold, uh, where you have the uh, sifting helps to take the pressure off the back and the belly. And, uh, you know, it feels good for the mother. And at the same time, it helps the baby to get into an optimal position for birth. The environment that we facilitate in this model of care uh, is very important to us and the families who opt to birth this way. So you've heard multiple midwives mention that we are always at a level lower than the birthing person. So this first picture is where there's a pause between the contraction, the mother's pushing. So she was squatting to push and uh, then she, uh, would in between contractions sit on her husband's lap. So um, her husband was supporting her from behind. And uh, if you see uh, Dr. Ashwatika is having a mirror and a torch in her hand, uh, it is pretty bright uh, because it was the daytime. Uh, but usually it is pretty dark, like you can see in the other picture <clears throat> next to it. But more importantly, what I would say is that we are sitting on the floor below the mother and uh, we are just looking and smiling and having that exchange you know, moment uh, between us because everything is so normal. There's no need to rush or hurry or do anything differently. We're just following the mother's lead. You know, we listen to the baby every 15 minutes in the second stage as per the ACOG guidelines. So um, we don't really have to do anything different when the mother's vitals are fine, the baby is doing fine. I would also like to add that <clears throat> we listen to the baby. So we only follow intermittent auscultation unless otherwise indicated. Uh, so in active labor, we listen every 30 minutes. And in uh, the second stage, we listen every 15 minutes. Uh, the second picture is where there are fairy lights. This mother is having some IV for hydration. There's a pause in between the contraction. So she's just like... Uh, sleeping off. She's also in her second stage of labor. And uh, you can see that the birth team is uh, just there to support her and observe and wait. A lot of patients, midwives have a lot of patients, I should say. So I'd like to play a birth video at this point of time. Uh, and what I would encourage all of you, uh, beautiful people listening in to do is just see how, uh, you know, take a note of how it feels in your own body specifically with respect to this birth video in this model of care. I also have at least a couple more birth videos um, that I'll be playing in other models of care. And I want you to just have this comparison and in your own minds and uh, see what are the contrasting things in all these different births. And, uh, you know, feel free to drop in in the comments your thoughts and we'll get to it at the end of my presentation. Um... Thank 
that's it. And one more. To keep moving. One more. Strong. Please drop in any of the emotions that you felt while watching. What felt different? Uh, many of you have been attending births for many, many years now in different settings. I would love to hear from all of you. But more importantly, I would also want you to, you know, watch the other birth video, which I'll play in a few minutes. And I would like you to tell me what you felt about that. A few more pictures of birth. Here you can see the fetal uh, ejection reflex in play, uh, where the baby is being born in water in the first. First image and in the second image, the bag of waters is intact. There is meconium in the bag of waters, but we were monitoring the baby and there was no sign of distress. Uh, we just kept going. So as midwives, we do have the tools to you know, artificially uh, rupture the membranes, but um, we don't often end up doing or needing to use that particular tool. Uh, it is a sense of accomplishment for the mother, for the baby, and you can see this, you know, the expressions that uh, these beautiful families have on their faces as they settle in, you know, into the calm uh, after the birth, where they are, you know, welcoming their baby and meeting their baby in person for the very first time. And their babies meeting them for the very first time. The very first picture is me, uh, you know, supporting this beautiful birthing goddess as her baby's crowning and she was in a lunging position. So you can see that we use different positions. Uh, women can definitely, as you saw in the previous couple of slides, women can definitely give birth even lying down, but they only do it if their bodies want it right? It's not a compulsion. It is not something we mandate. It is something that they feel is uh, working for them. But more often than not, you find them upright. In the immediate postpartum care, so this is where I'd like to bring in the distinction of this model, the midwife's care for both the mother and baby. And it doesn't mean that midwives work by themselves. As you see in all these pictures, we have more than one care provider present and we always work as teams and we involve the family at every step of the way. They are active participants, as you know, Augustine was discussing in the earlier presentation. The first picture is the family, uh, the father weighing the baby as the mother looks on and resting after birth. Here, the older sibling is uh, listening to his uh, baby's uh, baby brother's heartbeat. And this is the last picture is where we are doing a thorough newborn assessment. We are testing the stepping reflex of this newborn uh, whose cord is still intact and attached to the placenta while we are doing the exam because the parents wanted to, um, you know, delay cord clamping for a few hours and we respected those wishes because there was nothing else that needed to be done at that point of time anyway. We use tools like the blood score to, you know, estimate the guest gestational age and uh, we do a head-to-toe -to -toe assessment of the newborn baby to make sure that they are normal and healthy. 
we do a thorough examination of the placenta because uh, that is not just uh, to ensure that you know there are no chances of either primary or secondary postpartum hemorrhage, uh, but also to, you know, to honor that this particular organ has been uh, the baby's lifeline throughout pregnancy. And um, you can see the mother side of the placenta that's being examined as the family looks on uh, while the baby is latched on. The cord is again still intact. And uh, I, this particular family uh, opted for a lotus birth, and I'll be talking about it in just a minute. The second one is a placenta with a marginal insert, insertion of the cord. We do a perineal uh, assessment in case there are natural tears. Uh, we suture them up. Natural tears heal faster and uh, they are less painful than uh, episiotomies. Midwives are trained in the emergency uh, procedure of performing episiotomies, but in the 130 births that I have attended so far, I haven't cut a single episiotomy. Uh, the family is still intact. They are still together. The baby is always with the mother. There is no separation that happens. So the postpartum, you know, after, as you know, discussed before uh, by the other presenters, we do offer six weeks of postpartum in the midwifery model of care. And uh, you can see that the uh, families are happy uh, with their experience and uh, they are, uh, you know, again, having a community to share their parenting journeys with. So a few things I'd like to highlight here with uh, this model of care is that there's personalized care with informed decision making. The care slows down. We slow down as care providers. Yeah, because birth is not an emergency. Birth work, it works in India because we are the most populated planet on this country. And, you know, there is very, very uh, few situations where, you know, there's, uh, it's, uh, it's an emergency. Uh, complications, yes, do arise, and we are trained and skilled at uh, managing the complications, but also we can do it with, you know, slowing down, moving carefully, working in teams. We do risk assessment at every step of the care throughout the journey the family has with us. And midwives, we take care of both the mother and baby, and we offer choice. There is humanistic and safe care. That's really the cornerstones of this model. So the next model I had the opportunity to, to work in was uh, an urban hospital, uh, which offers obstetric care, but they did uh, decide to, you know, install a birth tub in their facility. And I had uh, the privilege of attending uh, 18 births at this center and also a couple of other hospitals. Uh, and uh, this was the very first uh, birth that I attended in the hospital. It was a water birth. Uh, she was a multiple who gave birth in water. Can you see how those previous photos were and how this photo is? Again, it's not about right or wrong. Uh, they're just different models. And uh, what uh, I think that we need to right, question ourselves is that, is this uh, care family-centric at every step of the way? So this is, a, this is a video of the hospital water birth. And I just want you to really, you know, compare in your own minds the previous birth that you saw at the, the first model and the second birth that I'm going to be playing now. What was so different or what did you like about either of these two models in terms of, you know, how the birth unfolded and what was happening? So I'm going to play this. so there were bright lights for sure. I wouldn't want to highlight that particular difference. And uh, I don't know if you noticed that my hands were there right next to the obstetrician's hands. Uh, I wasn't there in most of the video, but my hands were right there. And uh, the baby was born in the water and they did get the baby up to 
uh, the mother's uh, chest and I was uh, very aware that the baby is going to feel cold because there was air conditioning in the room. I'd already asked the uh, one of the nurses to turn off the air conditioning when the baby was out, but I wanted warm blankets for the baby, you know, and I was asking for that. So this is a hospital, another hospital where I uh, was called on for a birth. I hadn't met this uh, uh, mother before. So although I was there as a care provider, as a midwife, uh, I wasn't really operating from a midwifery model of care situation. She was a multip uh, at 39 weeks who was induced uh, for no medical reason that I know of uh, after I did a brief history taking when I uh, went in for her birth. And uh, we did have uh, one of the uh, doctors walk in uh, when she was in active labor, almost in transition, and say that, you know, tell her that, oh my gosh, you're in so much of pain. Uh, why don't you take an epidural? And, um, you know, after she talked to the mother, I just called the doctor aside and I'm like, uh, I just asked her that uh, if you really want her to have water birth as an option, uh, do you think uh, taking it? taking an epidural or offering her an epidural at this point of time is um, going to help her have this uh, option, right? Yeah. So very soon we got the mother into the tub and she gave birth, but you can see that uh, this is this picture was taken moments after she gave birth. Uh, she's having active management because she was induced with, uh, induced and augmented with uh, Sintocin. And uh, you see that the baby is nowhere in sight and everyone is uh, uh, very excited because that was their first water birth in this hospital uh, and they had this uh, picture taken at that moment and let's see what happened to this baby so the baby was separated one second ma'am she won he wants to cut yeah no go on so the pediatrician is uh, going through the motions of cutting the cord after birth and they're very used to, I mean, uh, it's not pointing fingers at any one person. It's just, I think I just want to shed light on how the system works as opposed to the previous model. They had the clamp on and uh, they wanted to, she just was going ahead and cutting and I had to intervene and say, stop. The father wants to be the person cutting the cord. He wants to be involved in this baby's. Yeah, you don't have to, no? Yeah. <clears throat> it will be chewy. Just keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. These are pictures of my other two clients who <clears throat> did opt for uh, midwifery care along with me, you know, throughout their uh, pregnancy and in the postpartum period, but chose to give birth in hospitals using the water birth facility there after the birth center uh, had closed down. So uh, they both had beautiful births. The first mom, uh, she had uh, a pretty precipitous second stage of labor and um, baby did just fine after birth. And the first, uh, the second mom in this picture, uh, she was a VBAC mom. Uh, she really was a birthing lioness, I can call her. She, uh, you know, was, uh, she refused all sorts of interventions at every step of the way. They wanted to uh, rupture the uh, membranes and she said, no, uh, I need two minutes. I need to go to the bathroom. And when she stepped into the bathroom uh, and came back, uh, uh, you know, there was a puddle of water on the floor. She just, you know, willed her body to uh, make things happen so that she could avoid any and all interventions. She had a beautiful birth. No episiotomies for any of my clients in the hospital. So I advocated pretty fiercely and I said that we don't have to routinely do episiotomy. Uh, this couple, you know, um, beautiful story again. Um, they were doing all the things uh, and she was seven centimeters dilated when uh, they offered to break the bag of waters. And this, uh, they did <clears throat> take on this particular, uh, uh, you know, intervention and uh, they after the membranes ruptured, uh, there was mech 
And uh, while they were reassuring heart tones, there was nothing really wrong with the baby at that point of time uh, in, in their labor. The doctors uh, did suggest quite strongly for a C-section and uh, um, they um, decided to go in for a C-section. It wasn't an emergency. After the decision was made, uh, the, it took almost an hour to get her into the operation theater. So uh, a lot of people had uh, questions about keeping the placenta and the baby attached. Uh, I did help facilitate at least four lotus births in the hospital setting. Lotus birth is where the umbilical cord is not clamped and cut until it dries and falls off on its own. So the placenta remains with the baby. Uh, there is no uh, physiological or medical benefits to it. It's more a spiritual practice. But, uh, you know, as, mid as a midwife, I feel that uh, this option should be available for anyone who wants to take the responsibility and take care of the placenta and honor the placenta in this way. So we wash the placenta, we place it on uh, clean sheets, and we have agents to absorb all the extra moisture. So there is like a layer of salt. And then we use turmeric and neem and dried rose petal powder herbs to keep it dry. Uh, and this dressing of the placenta has changed at least twice a day. And the baby and placenta remain together until the natural separation occurs. <clears throat> So in the hospital mod, um, model of care, uh, we have to quickly sum up, uh, we have the antenatal and postpartum care that I provided for quite a few of my clients under the midwifery model of care. Uh, the water birth was facilitated in the hospitals. There was always a separate team for the mother and baby, and they were more often than not separated. But for my clients, as I said, there, were no, there was no episiotomy done and the baby was with the mother till the birth of the placenta and then they were, the baby was taken along with the placenta to the warmer. So all of my clients' um, babies did have optimal cot clamping uh, delay of at least 5 to 20 minutes in the hospital. I was present for my clients and I was the person uh, providing the continuity of care. The good, really, really good thing about having this hospital uh, set up is that we had access to high-tech facility and surgical skills. Sometimes they were used uh, when not really absolutely required, but then I hope that, you know, we can make use of this high-tech facilities and the skill when absolutely required. The next model of care I'd like to talk about is the rural hospital and the subcenters where uh, there is nurse midwifery care that's offered. And uh, again, me and a couple of my teammates had this uh, opportunity of uh, volunteering in a rural hospital and uh, one of the subcenters. And uh, we uh, were there for a month, about a month, and we attended. So it was what they called as a medium volume center, but uh, in terms of midwifery model of care, it was a high volume center. The prenatal care that we offered there was uh, seeing about 20 to 30 women uh, per day, uh, which I think most obstetric model of care, uh, that's how it is you know, built where you do see a lot of people. But then uh, we did spend at least half an hour with each of the moms trying to infuse elements of midwifery care into their prenatal visits. And uh, uh, we did have uh, an obstetrician, a consultant obstetrician attend clinic along with us. You know, since we were three of us, one of us would do uh, detailed history taking and uh, questioning, you know, like basically discussing their care. I would do that typically with the OB and my colleagues would be uh, doing the belly palpation, listening to the baby, the fundal height measurements, taking their weight and so on and so forth. Uh, the first picture is that in the antenatal clinic and the second picture is that of the labor ward where they had come in for NSTs because uh, they have a policy of waiting up to 41 weeks before trying to get a labor going. So here uh, for the NSTs, we were just palpating their uh, abdomen to find baby's position before we put on the probe and run the tests. 
And this is probably a picture that's familiar to a lot of uh, the attendees today who are uh, used to working in um, or have had uh, experience working in a government setup or a low resource setup. They were actually a very well resourced center uh, and uh, they had a three bedded labor ward with curtains and the curtains were all, 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 almost always used to provide uh, some semblance of privacy, especially when there were more uh, than one a uh, woman in labor at that point of time. There were gloves that were being reused after going through a sterilization process, protocol and process in the center. That was something that was very new to us coming from urban areas. It was a very simple setup, but they also encouraged their mothers to move in labor. Uh, we told them to turn off the lights because bright lights are not really needed and that what that's what you know reduces the stress hormones and uh, we were working with the nurse midwifery team in the labor ward the obstetrician would be only on the phone uh, for any required support but uh, uh, the nurse midwives were the ones who ran the labor ward and we were there for that period of time to to help them and we did a lot of information exchange. So this was the very first birth that we attended uh, of a primip and we encouraged her to, you know, adopt uh, different positions, but uh, she felt most comfortable in a lying down position and she did give birth lying down and had a first degree tear, natural tear. Uh, so the nurse midwives there uh, are usually the protocol that they follow is doing a routine episiotomy for a primary and not doing episiotomy for a multip. So that was a protocol that they followed because they had this uh, uh, thought in the back of their heads that uh, someone who's a primary or a primip cannot uh, push the baby out and they need help with that. But yeah, so uh, we, we had uh, made a plan with the midwives there uh, to you know not cut an episiotomy on this mother and she had a first degree tear which was uh, sutured. So we encountered some of the women who had uh, some risk factors in their pregnancy. This particular uh, mother, she was uh, from a very, very remote uh, village and uh, she had no access to any antenatal prenatal care. And uh, she was uh, got to the main hospital from one of the remote areas uh, because uh, she uh, was, her uh, blood pressure was elevated and uh, we were uh, suspecting IUGR. And uh, we had no idea about her LMP, so we couldn't really determine dates. So uh, at that particular day when she came for admission, uh, it was the weekend, so the ultrasound technician was not available to do the scan and to confirm IUGR. So normally in these situations uh, where they are having uh, certain risk factors, uh, most of these uh, mothers would be directly sent in for a C-section because the hospital doesn't have the resources to give an option of a trial, to offer an option of trial of labor. So because uh, me and my team were there at that point of time, uh, I did consult and um, confer with the obstetrician and say that there is no reason for uh, Primip to have a C-section without having a trial of labor because we can induce her uh, labor. Uh, obviously, there is uh, an OT down the uh, hall and if she he really needs it, she or her baby really needs it, then we can always transfer her care to the surgeons. And uh, the obstetrician did agree, and uh, we did induce this mother with a bulb Foley catheter to ripen her cervix, and uh, her labor picked up. Like Within six hours, the bulb Foley fell out, and uh, she was augmented with uh, pitocin and uh, dotaverin. Subsequently, you know, she didn't really need any medical uh, assistance and support. The meds uh, were there, but the pitocin didn't have to be increased uh, beyond a certain titration. And uh, she stood up, she had pressure, she moved, and she rolled her baby out. And she did not even tear in the process. And her baby was not IUGR, uh, weighed about 2.5 kgs, which is uh, a pretty decent birth weight However, her uh, baby did need uh, NICU admission after birth, like 24 hours, hours after birth because of uh, uh, jaundice. 
uh, being quite high. Uh, so this photo was taken uh, a few days after the baby was born, at least I think a week or two after the baby was born, she was still there. And uh, she was hand expressing and also directly feeding the baby. And she was very happy to see me in the corridors and we did meet and chat and I was able to offer her, uh, you know, postpartum care um, for the entire, you know, uh, three weeks that she was there. So I had the opportunity to also visit one of the village subcenters, uh, which is deep in the forest, and uh, they do have a remote uh, labor unit over there. So these are pictures of that labor unit. It is very, very bare bones, uh, but they also have a pretty big community of nurse midwives and uh, they station uh, student nurses in the subcenters to learn. Uh, so there was a, a community day that uh, I attended, a day full of trainings uh, where, you know, all the traditional midwives from different parts um, of that community had gathered along with the students and uh, we had uh, the students with different presentations about reproductive uh, health the traditional midwives uh, had beautiful animated stories to share uh, when I asked them, you know, what position uh, do the moms give birth in at home? So they attend home births. So they were saying that nowadays it's almost always a lying down position uh, because that's what the obstetricians told us would be a better. But uh, what we are traditionally used to is taking a long piece of garment and actually braiding it in braiding it up and then making a coil out of it and then we place that on the ground and have one of the midwives or the mother or sister supporting the the birthing mother from behind and the midwife is always on the front of the mom to encourage her to push and to deliver the baby we also had an opportunity to train, uh, talk about, share our experiences about how uh, we as modern midwives, uh, independent uh, critical thinking midwives work with facilitating and enabling physiology to make uh, labor uh, unfold in a normal manner uh, and in a safe manner. Uh, so we talked about different aspects and it was a very interactive session. These are all the nurse midwives who work both in the subcenter as well as the main multi-speciality hospital in the labor ward. And here are some of the positions that I showed them, the lunging position and, uh, you know, how uh, lifting and tucking the abdomen can help, you know, reposition the cervix to help you know, for the dilation and how a position like getting on all fours can work with gravity to facilitate birth. So in the predominantly nurse midwife model of care, we had antenatal and postpartum care uh, with uh, the obstetrician and the pediatrician. Uh, the midwives were not really involved in uh, these two aspects of the care. So they were involved mainly in uh, labor and birth and immediate postpartum. The mothers uh, ate, drank, moved freely in labor. They were encouraged to try different positions. Uh, this particular hospital, uh, it's not a government setup. It's um, in central India, and they have a very humanistic approach. Uh, although they would tell their mothers to lie on their backs and push, they also had some tenets of, you know, touching the mother, encouraging her to use her body. Uh, to give birth and uh, speaking very kindly to her. Uh, they would get a little aggressive during the pushing stage to just encourage them. Uh, it was uh, well-intentioned and they would also hold the mother's hand and be there for her support. And the mothers always had uh, at least one or two of their family, usually the mother or the sister present uh, during the birth. What was uh, the stark difference that stood out in my mind was the lack of preparation and education for the mothers. There was a midwifery team. Again, the nurse midwives handled both the mother and baby during the birth. Uh, they were the main care providers. Um, and there is uh, OT down the hall and uh, there is surgical skill uh, when absolutely required. But even over here in this uh, particular setting, they did have a 50% C-section rate. Again, as Deepika had shared uh, in her session, the WHO recommendation is 10 to 15%. So, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, they do have more high risk moms because of chronic malnutrition and uh, poverty and all the other socioeconomic factors that come into play. But, you know, uh, one of the main intentions uh, that I had in my mind was to see if mothers can have a trial of labor before you know, being wheeled off uh, into the operation theater. Uh, I think there is no way uh, in many, many cases, unless like there's a Privia or uh, a transverse baby uh, or um, twins that need C-section to be delivered, um, there is no reason more often than not why they cannot have a trial of labor. Nobody can predict. People can have, mothers can have risk factors, babies can have risk factors, but um, the question that I think we as care providers need to ask ourselves is, do we need to facilitate a trial of labor or do we need to send uh, them off for a C-section? And that's especially important for such a community because uh, recovering from a major abdominal surgery is also a big hurdle in their future. So to kind of sum up my presentation, uh, it is a balancing act. I think uh, models can vary according to the needs of the community, according to what uh, you know the community has access to. But uh, can we bring uh, you know midwifery model of care uh, into you know these locations, these already existing, pre-existing locations, to improve the experience for everybody concerned? So I'd like to ask you all, how are you planning on changing your birth environment and practice? Thank you so much for listening to me. This is how you guys can get in touch with me. Madilu is there and my own Insta page, Demystify Birth. And I'm also a part of the Midwifery Wisdom Collective. Uh, so you can get in touch with me through all these channels. And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to present to all you beautiful folks. Thank so you so know. much, Chetna. What um, a beautiful presentation. I know we all really felt moved by those images and your descriptions of care and all those models. And it really brought home all of the presentations these last two days and made it really clear about what's happening in India and what, what we can change. I just thank you so much. I invite Thank everyone you. to turn on your cameras and ask any last questions. I have a poll up in the chat about what was most surprising about this conference. And uh, obviously, we would love to hear from you what you're planning to integrate into your practice and care models. I'm so, so impressed with this presentation, Chitna. I'm so impressed with you <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so grateful that all of you decided to join us for this adventure. I'd also like to know if you all want to do this again. Should we hold another conference next year? Because it feels like we got some really meaningful, interesting sharing. So uh, opening up the floor now for questions, please unmute yourself if you have a question or type it in the chat and I'll read it out. And that could be for Chetna or for both of us for anything that you heard or saw during the conference these last two days. I'll give my feedback to you because I don't want to echo. Okay. I totally, totally think we should do this conference again. Deepika <laughs> is saying she doesn't want to echo, but she's saying she wants to do the conference again. Yes. Totally, totally. Right. We got both of those. Yes. Urvachi wanted a breach presentation guideline. I would love to share it with uh, you, you know, within a week or so. And I, I shared guess. a link to the emergency breach course on the website. So that's another option yeah. for folks. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good course that Augustine has. You have the reverse vultures and the vultures maneuver on Spinning Baby's website, uh, Shilpi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Gita, for your encouraging words. And Shiji, and also Sharda. <laughs> So one thing, if uh, if there is a person who has no relation to a medical field, how can they, you know, join into midwifery model? Well, I think Chetna is the perfect one to answer this. Hey, Chetna, <laughs> what was your profession before yeah. midwifery? So uh, the first degree that I got was that of engineering, and I worked as an engineer for six years, and I had my baby and then never looked back because I knew at that point of time in my pregnancy itself that... I don't want to be an engineer anymore. You know, midwifery is my calling. So there is, uh, you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse to become a midwife. Midwifery is a separate profession. Yes. Nursing and physicians yeah. have separate professions. 
They're related in that we, all of us could be in the birth room, but they're all separate professions. Same with the doula. A doula is also a separate profession. It's not a, a part of either of them, right? We're related in that we all work in the birth room, but there are separate courses, separate pathways, separate certifications. And I think the, the words that we're looking for here, I'll just add a little insight, um, is the difference between nurse midwifery, which is a pathway where you become a nurse and then take advanced midwifery training, and what's called direct entry midwifery, where you skip nursing and directly enter the profession of midwifery. And that is what Chetna is, and that is what we are really advocating for with this conference and with our presence here in India, is that it is a separate profession. You do not need to have medical prerequisites. And that in fact, to be a competent, critical thinking, independent provider, oftentimes it's better if you don't have nursing first, because nursing, again, has a totally different uh, prof process, including following orders and uh, being an assistant rather than being an independent primary care provider. So we are at definitely advocating for independent direct entry midwifery, where you enter the profession directly. And the pathway that we are advocating for right now is the International Registry of Midwives. And I dropped that in the chat a little while back, International Midwife, I believe .com, maybe .org. Um, that is the pathway that Chitna has finished and uh, pass the exam in order to become a certified international midwife or a CIM. And currently there are 13 countries in the world that accept the CIM credential for country licensing. And we are hoping that as more people become CIMs that we can pressure the Indian uh, authorities to also issue reciprocal certification and licensure as a result of that pathway. It does not yet exist, but that is the, the pathway we're hoping to make happen. Hi, Augustine. I don't know, Augustine, if we say this is a destiny. I'm hearing you from last two days, day and night. Yesterday, I, you know, I've attended one of your uh, Gold's Speaker Notes workshop also. And that is immense learning. And I'm so overwhelmed, like listening to Barbara, listening to you, then having a session with Sneha and the session on body work. Like, I just love the presentation, which was given by Chetna about different model of care, being in, you know, as a physiotherapist and uh, as a you know, trained doula. Uh, I have visited Sanctum, which was in there in Hyderabad and uh, got to know, to see this midwifery led service and which amazed me because here in North India, we don't have such kind of facility. And uh, we are like, I'm especially associated with hospital and looking uh, for the best hospital, which is just close to the, that kind of service, which we talk, which we say. So as someone said, you know, yesterday also, sometimes people, the moms, they feel that we are robbed. You know, you are uh, telling them something X, Y, Z, and then once they visit the hospital, it is completely different spectrum of care, which they provide. Now, learning about the midwifery led center, the birth home and all. So we talk a lot about, you know, what we were providing to the uh, mothers and there were mothers, those who have delivered here. I would love to hear the challenges faced by you because, you know, uh, there was the birth home. Then we got to know that the birth home was shut, maybe, you know, because of any. So there is some learning always whenever we, we are working on some projects and all. So uh, like anything that you would like to share with us, because definitely it gives us a, a new horizon to think that, you know, like midwifery is, can also be a wholesome field to practice and uh, since we are we are very few and I, I do have seen here in North India also you know amongst the doctors they are also very much interested in providing such kind of service or in actually you know motivating the sisters also that you know you should go so I have learned about pertinence hospital also that they are training the midwives and they are having their own uh, training programs so would you yeah. like to share Chit? Well, I, I, I know Chetna is going to chime in and I just want to say just a quick answer to your question is um, we are on the cusp of change. That's the title of this conference. It is coming. We can all feel it. Things are different than they used to be. Clients are demanding it. And many entrepreneurial uh, birth homes and, and providers and physicians are trying to meet that need. The problem is that we have a lack of understanding of the holistic model, of the critical thinking, of the risk assessment, of the balance of care. And I feel like that's really what Chitna and I can offer 
to this space is really helping to up-level the education and bring us into alignment with both evidence-based care, the balance of normal, natural, and safe, as well as teaching about humanistic care involving uh, informed decision-making and true you know, kindness in care. So I think we can bring that um, in a new way. And for the birth home itself, Chetna was a partner. I was not. I was. I was just uh, transiently uh, associated, and the birth home was thriving. Uh, there were just some differences of opinion, business wise, um, and so this new model will also, I'm sure, be thriving. And the main problem that we discovered with the birth home really had to do with the way that the Indian medical culture is set up. So we're, in a lot of ways, we're importing a Western model, right? Birth centers have existed in UK and the US and Australia and Sweden. And, you know, birth centers are are kind of a lot of places. And uh, the birth center, the freestanding birth center, the first model that Chetna presented on, which does not have obstetric services or OT or any surgical procedures, um, it doesn't work so well in India because transports are challenging because the facilities are not used to receiving those transports. Traffic is a mess and there just is no integrative model. And so part of the decision to close the birth center was the fact that we needed to open this new model where we have truly integrative care. And I think this is still nascent. It's still so beginning that it, this model is not in Jetna's slideshow because we haven't made it yet. <laughs> but the idea is that we have this balanced integrative care between obstetrics and midwifery, between the art and the science, the medical and the midwifery. And they blend seamlessly so that again, the right provider is with the right client for the right uh, needs. And, and that is a new model. So Jetna, I know you have things to share there. Yeah, I think uh, the birth home was a proof of concept model. And uh, as Augustine said, it was thriving and it worked very well, you know, except when uh, transfers were required and uh, the constant feedback that we got from our clients who needed those uh, transfers for a cesarean or the baby had to be shifted to the NICU for uh, further care and attention uh, was that why can't we why can't we have it all in one place? Why do we have to go to the other place which offers such a different model of care? Because we don't know anyone there and we know you guys. So we we feel most comfortable with you. And uh, I think as midwives, that's the other thing that we do <laughs> is uh, we listen to our uh, folks and our people. And uh, we told them that, yes, let's make this happen. And uh, that's exactly what we are set out to do at Madilu, to make it an integrated uh, all in-house setup so that uh, people don't have to seek care uh, outside of the system which functions on the midwifery model of care, even though we are you know, offering obstetrics and neonatal level facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And all the yeah. best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do want to add here that we are Augustine and I both are very passionate about not having this care model, just having it to ourselves, having it only for Madilu. I think it should reach everywhere uh, throughout India. We need more such centers. And that's something we're very passionate about uh, creating as well. Yeah. Helping others make it happen. Thank you so much, Chetna. I think I really learned so much today about childbirth. The only reason I haven't gotten, I mean, I didn't give birth by this process just because I didn't know about this. So imagine how many people don't know about this you know, today. And I make sure because every every one of us have our own circles of people whom we talk about, whom we have credibility with. And I'm sure I will spread the word across and I will be part of it in with this one way or the other. And then to just summarize what I have understood, I mean, best gotten out of it is, you know, uh, childbirth is a physiological process that just got stuck in my mind now because... I know as a doctor, uh, when I was going through my MBBS, many times I was just going through it like a disease probably. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great unlearning for me today and different positions mother can take and episiotomy is not, not needed is, you know, highlight of the entire thing uh, for me <laughs> and uh, placenta being one of the important parts. So, these are my highlight points and I will never forget. Thank you so much for educating us, Agastrin and Chetna and everybody who spoke for the last two days. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's a great overview. <clears throat> Manisha, can I call on you to say something? I'm actually a little after listening to everything. And I'm trying to correlate with my words what went wrong. <laughs> still trying to, you know, uh, absorb and understand. And still seeing the same old thing that shouldn't be seen about birth. Uh, but yet, it's like as if even though you're not part of that birth, yet because you're part of the system, you are also responsible for it. Mm -hmm. What I feel. Yeah. yeah. And, I felt the same when I was working in the hospital. I can relate to what you're feeling. Yeah, and it's, it's so difficult to absorb. Uh, every day you see the same thing happening. And uh, again, yeah, change is there, but... How and when is what we need to, I think, work around. And it's also about how we accept it because at the end, majority of the crowd goes into a hospital for birth. That's the whole idea. So yeah. hoping yeah. that things change and at least we can get back. Yeah. Change needs to come from all places, right? Within, without, above, below, inside, outside, all the ways. <laughs> you guys are a big part of that change. Any other feedback from this uh, two-day conference? Would love to hear anyone's takeaways. We have a few comments in chats as well. Yeah, definitely the certified international midwife process can be done in India. That's what I offer. I'm a preceptor with the International Registry of Midwife. That is the process that Deepika is in and Dr. Ashu is in. You, you saw their presentations. Lots to come. So we will have our grand opening at Mailu in June, and we hope to see you all there. And in the meantime, uh, really, really am grateful that you all took the time to be with us for these two days in our inaugural conference. Remember, you can follow us on midwiferywisdom.com is the U.S. site. Midwiferywisdom.in is the Indian site. And we're adding services all the time. You can come follow us on Instagram or Facebook. And of course, stay in touch with Chetna and I specifically because we love your support. Thank you everyone so much. What an amazing conference. Thanks friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to say one thing. Please. I just wanted to say, I mean, right from the beginning and while watching this entire thing, I think just like we have schools in every area in the community, we should have birthing homes in every little area of the city and we shouldn't have to go across cities or across the city to go find the or across city. the country how many of you yeah across the country i went across the yeah. you know, to another yeah. place so it's yeah really amazing if we could have with you guys you know let's all visualize it right this is what yeah. rishita has in her mind we will see yeah. it happen with your <laughs> Thank you so and much. That's the vision of Marilu. Yes. That's where we that's want that. to go. Yeah. yeah that's, I mean, that's what I could see and I'm I'm already seeing it happen. That's wonderful. Awesome. That's awesome. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for, you know, being a part of this movement by participating in this conference. And I think uh, we are all very motivated to make changes in our own communities. And that's how it should be that, you know, the change starts in our own communities. And that's how the, the potential for it to spread far and wide is quite immense that way. And we really thank you for all your support and your well wishes and uh, see you all tomorrow.